<laughs> All right. Slush day two, afternoon. Thank you guys so much for coming and listening to our upcoming talk. Um, so we'll jump right into it. So I'm here with Caroline Spiegel, who is the founder of Quinn. And I'd love to hear in your words what Quinn is, and then we'll get into how you came up with the idea. Yeah, so hi, everyone. I'm Caroline. I'm so excited to be here at Slush. And thank you, Kia. Um, so Quinn is an app for audio erotica. You can kind of think of it as like an OnlyFans for erotic storytelling. So there's no visuals, no images or videos on the app. And we're trying to bring a new medium to the erotic content uh, landscape um, and really focus on immersive, ethical, female-first content. So tell us how you came up with this very unusual product idea. <laughs> yeah. So Quinn actually came from a very personal, intimate need, personal need, um, as so many products do. Um, I was studying computer science at Stanford, and my junior year, I had really struggled with an eating disorder. And as sort of a result of that, I struggled with something called FSD, or female sexual dysfunction. Um, obviously, we're all kind of familiar with ED and erectile dysfunction, but FSD goes kind of overlooked. There are over 30 drugs on the market for uh, FDA-approved drugs um, on the market for ED and zero for FSD. So kind of had this realization my senior year and uh, saw sort of the dearth of erotic content options for women, the dearth of sexual wellness products for women, and then, <laughs> kind of a winding road, stumbled upon audio erotica on Reddit and Tumblr. And if you guys kind of were around in the fan fiction days, you know, on Tumblr, on Wattpad, on Reddit, um, that's where this genre really got started. So I fell in love with the medium there, and the rest is kind of history. Dropped out and started Quinn. Okay, so you found the medium, and then you realized there's not really a good app or user right. experience, and you decided to build that. Exactly. Um, did you have any apprehension about building a company and a product in this space, which is still, you know, kind of stigmatized and a lot of people are uncomfortable with that? Yeah, I mean, I was really nervous to tell my parents, <laughs> but they're actually really chill about it. And that's one thing that I've learned about building in this category is you can never judge like a book by its cover in the sense that some people who seem super sex positive and progressive actually end up being the most conservative and the most sort of like repressed and, and vice versa. So I definitely, I definitely think building in this category has made me just realize, um, yeah, not to judge people too soon and to, you know, try and meet them where they are. <laughs> We'll get into other aspects of company building, but you've yeah. also raised some venture funding. I think you said about eight million or so. Um, tell me about that experience, and if you've taken any sort of lessons in how you want to do future fundraising. Yeah, I mean, I guess the biggest lesson from pitching for Quinn and raising for Quinn is just to kind of To, to really like not take no's as personal rejection and really try and kind of like remove your ego from the process, which if there are any founders in the audience, it's literally impossible. Raise your hand if you're a founder. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay. A few. So you believe your baby is like the most beautiful baby ever. Exactly. And <laughs> exactly. And it's, yeah, it's your baby and it's really painful to get a lot of no's. But I guess just to remind everyone, everyone gets turned down all the time, constantly. And it's your resilience and your ability to bounce back and learn from the no that, that matters most. So, so <laughs> speaking of, um, one of the things I find super interesting about Quinn is that, and yourself, is that, yes, you're building a product and a company in this kind of unusual space, but you're also just a founder like everybody else, like everybody else in this room that's building a company and a product. So how do you, tell us about your approach to product building. Where uh, do you yeah. start? 
what are your KPIs? <laughs> what, do you have a product team that you meet with all the time and you guys talk about, you know, we're going to tweak the fonts, we're going to change? <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's really funny because so often in these interviews, I'm really talking about, you know, building through stigma and sex and all of that, which I love. But it's also really fun to talk about just generally my perspective on company building and product building. Um, one thing that I just that I think really powers all of Quinn is we're about the details. And I think there's this myth that, you know, you should just kind of like hire great people and let them do whatever and let them do great work. But how do you know that the people are great and that the work is great if you're not in the details with them? And I don't think that's micromanagement. I think it's just being in the product and the details in the work and having experts lead different functions in the org um, so that you don't kind of end up with PM culture that gets, you know, kind of politicky and difficult. And so I, I, we really focus on reviewing, editing, feedback is constant being in the details, and I also like to tie it back to the sex part of Quinn and the spicy part of Quinn, the standard for our product is so much higher because immediately people see this product and they laugh at it, they think it's stupid or silly or, uh, I don't know, not a, not a legitimate thing. And so we have to do, go the extra mile to make sure we're taken seriously. Um, and so that's definitely a part of our, our culture. Is, is that like sort of an additional pressure that you feel that you need to legitimize your app and your product more than people building business software? Yes and no. I mean, it's also for the customer because I think like users are super on edge when they're looking at a new erotic content product or really any new product, but they're particularly sensitive, right? Um, they're used to kind of these mainstream tube sites where there's pop-up windows and the UX is terrible and hard to navigate and they're on edge. So it's really important to make the user feel safe, and then of course also to be taken seriously, you know, by investors and by other um, kind of gatekeepers in tech. So let's talk about the community. You have creators, you have listeners um, who listen to the content. Tell us, like, how big is the community now of creators and of folks who tune in? Yeah. So we don't have like an enormous amount of creators. We have around 70 now. And it's really like a curated marketplace. And eventually, we'd like to be able to expand that. But it's this balance of increasing the offering and keeping the quality bar really high. Um, and then each sort of creator brings on their own fan base. And there's different sort of fandoms and um, personal brands that each creator sort of adopts. And as far as subscribers, we're Really excited. We've grown 400% year over year for two years. Um, and it was not always like that <laughs> before 2021. But now things are going better. So on the listener and the creator side. <laughs> That's interesting that you said that a lot of the creators already had followings and listeners, and they just brought them on. Do you have any folks who kind of started by joining Quinn and making content there? Yeah, Quinn is unique in that we're, you know, like, look at OnlyFans or Patreon, right? Um, creators are bringing their audiences onto Patreon, which is obviously great for Patreon. Uh, but, you know, it's hard to be discovered. I would say TikTok is a good example of something that's like a discovery engine. Um, and Quinn is a little bit of both. We're actually a hybrid in a lot of different ways. We borrow some things from me like traditional media. We borrow some things from platforms like OnlyFans and Patreon, various kind of like features and creator things we do. Um, but yeah, and I was going to say something else about the creators, of the, their fans. Anyway, yes, it happens both ways. <laughs> um, yeah. How do you think about these other platforms that a lot of those creators um, came from before Quinn existed? Do you think of them as competitors, or do you think of them as just their different channels for the creators to engage with communities? Yeah. Well, you know, it actually, I just remembered what I was going to say, and it answers this question, is that like the vast majority of the customers on OnlyFans are men, right? Which should not be like a massive surprise, but really think about that. Like our creators were actually not on OnlyFans because they create content for women. So we're actually one of the like first kind of platforms that's like, I don't want to say objectifying men, but like men are the commodity, right? These like hot voice actors that girls love and we're, we're doing the opposite, the inverse of OnlyFans, right? So yeah. <laughs> so they're not on OnlyFans because they're not selling like videos and, and pics, right? They're selling these hot sort of 
erotic stories, <laughs> audio stories. So where were they? You, were they yes. just putting up videos on Reddit or audio, audio yeah, on, yeah. on Reddit? Like, where are they coming from to you? This is a great question. They're, they come from everywhere, truly. But what we look for is a large female following, a large, very engaged female following. You know, like you'll see some of these like hot chefs that blow up on TikTok or like the guy that chops wood, right? It's like kind of the female gaze is still a little inscrutable to me, but we find them there. We find them on Reddit, on Tumblr, these other audio erotica communities, and then also more traditional voice acting and acting backgrounds as well. And how do you think about business model yeah. and evolving that and growing that? Yeah, I mean, so... So much to say here, but I think the traditional sort of like subscription media content business, I'm thinking like Headspace and Calm, right? They have sort of evolved into being performance marketing arbitrage. So they're not really, like they're not known for their user engagement. <laughs> um, whereas there are, uh, we're, Quinn, for example, 25% uh, of our users use the app every day. So they have over 28 sessions every month. So this is like, a, a, we're not trying to do performance marketing arbitrage. We're not interested in locking you into a lifetime subscription for something you don't use. So anyway, moving away from that, and I think moving into a space of like micropayments to creators, right? Like I mentioned, they have these diehard fan bases. And what if I really like that influence and I want to give him like a rose or I want to buy him a cup of coffee, right? Things that resemble OnlyFans or Patreon, but they have sort of the Quinn twist and the Quinn safety and the Quinn brand appeal um, that we can offer. Are you um, seeing trends, like a really common trend in the creator economy is where you see um, a small number of super creators who are really responsible for the, the bulk of the content or the bulk of the revenue or the bulk of the, you know, uh, engagement from the fans. Are you seeing a similar distribution or is it more? Yeah, what a great question. We do. Uh, I guess I've heard it referred to as like the creator power law, but it actually is true on sites like Netflix too, like, you know, like Squid Games and Bridgerton, these shows that just blow all the other shows out of the water. And it's the same on OnlyFans. There are these creators at the top that are doing 80% of the whole platform's you know, revenue. And on Quinn, we have, you know, some juggernaut voice actors who are just the, the top dogs. So definitely notice that. It's really interesting. What are the uh, characteristics of these super creators on Quinn? Well, some of them brought their platforms onto Quinn. Okay. And, you know, our top creator, Nadio, check him out, seriously. Like, you guys will love him. Uh, he actually started on Quinn. So he was like someone who was kind of discovered and built his fan base just kind of on Quinn. He's an anonymous voice actor. And I think it's kind of a mix of things, but his storytelling is incredible. It's very immersive. And he does a range of stories. So he'll do what we call like M-DOM or rougher content. And then he'll also do boyfriend, gentle content, and even a little historical sort of Regency era every now and again. <laughs> Interesting. Um, kind of shifting gears a little bit. What have you found to be the most surprising challenge and then the most surprising kind of um, awesome part about building Quinn? Huh. Okay, so I think the most surprising challenge you know what? I think it's actually related to the de being in the details thing. Um, the challenge is just the constant refocusing. I think as a, as a founder, you're pulled in a million different directions. And I didn't think it, like that this would be the challenge, but the challenge is saying no to like 99% of things and only doing the one thing that moves the needle. Um, and it's challenging to do that because you're like, oh my God, I want to do this. I want to build this feature. I want to do this partnership. And just being like, no to basically everything. Yes to this one thing that's moving, moving the needle. Um, the best part or the most like surprising best part, I guess, maybe it's a little cheesy, but like talking to our listeners um, and the people that use Quinn and love Quinn and like it's transformed their, I don't, you know, their sex lives. Um, there are a lot of people just, you know, in varying degrees, it could be, oh, I'm going through like a brief dry spell and Quinn really helped me 
reignite that part of myself to, you know, I had a miscarriage and I haven't felt turned on in years, right? So there's a, everyone struggles in this area and it's really nice to be able to add a little bit of joy to the world. <laughs> do you still do like um, subscriber, like user testing sessions? Definitely. Um, well, we get a lot of unsolicited DMs of just like telling us <laughs> essays and feedback, which we love. Um, but we also do like little focus groups or kind of, you know, our more like die hard subscribers that really love Quinn. We ask them often for specific feedback. <laughs> I should have known that you get a lot of unsolicited DMs <laughs> and opinions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so this would not be a tech or startup conference in 2023 if we didn't talk about AI, obviously. Obviously. Um, <laughs> are you guys infusing any kind of AI capabilities? How are you thinking about that? Yeah. Um, I feel like the challenge for us is really AI is like this <coughs> buzzword. <laughs> okay, yeah. And for creators, you know, Quinn was built <coughs> by and with and for creators. And so AI can kind of sound, like especially generative AI, can sound a little threatening to be like, we're going to replace your voice actor <laughs> with AI. So we would never, ever do that. Um, sorry, I don't want to like talk over you. So like, sorry. No, take your time. Um, so we would never do that. But I definitely think we're like looking at these companies that have really captured users' imaginations, like Replica and Character AI, um, that are really compelling and just interesting to kind of see how they're moving in this space and keep tabs on it. And we use AI, not generative AI, in our recommendation engine and in other parts of our product, too. But I get the hype. I get it. <laughs> what, is your, what is your take on um, generative AI-based content? Yeah. I mean, it's particularly difficult in erotic content where consent is such a big piece of it. You could imagine someone using a creator or, or a celebrity's voice, say, um, to say like things that this celebrity did not consent to say or to saying or doing, which is problematic. So, <laughs> I'm so sorry. Okay, I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Take your time, seriously. Um, yeah. So there can be a lot of different like problems, but I think like probably with a lot of consent and protections of the creators and, and voices involved, I, I think it could be interesting, but it's like really important to do it ethically, if at all. What about the listener aspect of it? I know um, OnlyFans, you mentioned them, yeah. they're not allowing AI created content mm -hmm. in part because they want the fans to actually know that they're communicating with the creators that they're subscribing to. No, that's exactly it. And it, they, like, both the perspectives go hand in hand. It's like creators obviously don't want their work stolen to, like, to like, replace them, obviously. And listeners don't want their favorite creators to go away. Um, and they, don't even, they wouldn't even want to consume content that didn't feel truly authentic. And I think like, erotic content and comedy is another one, like just generally like creativity, these things that are like uniquely human kind of soulful uh, th uh, experiences that are, you know, we're far, we're way, way, way off from not even kind of coming into Quinn's vision. Yeah. Are you thinking about going beyond what you're doing right now? Is Quinn going to be offering all kinds of content? <laughs> you know, so we're never going to offer visual <laughs> content. But um, definitely interested in longer form audio content. Um, <coughs> Audible's top grossing genre is romance. So very interested in that and very interested in just erotic storytelling in all its forms. <laughs> OK, I mean, I'm just excited to see where the app goes yeah. in a few years. <laughs> kind of stepping, taking a step back, just bigger picture in the future. What is putting your, you know, founder business hat on? Where do you see Quinn as a company like ten years from now? Is it going to be publicly traded? Is it going to be a unicorn? Like business-wise, where do you think this is going? I really, uh, I'm, I'm hoping yes, it will be. I think it's really about empowering um, creators to create erotic content that doesn't look like 
the kind of content, erotic content we're used to consuming. It's not Pornhub, it's not this sort of graphic, almost violent, just like in-your-face imagery. It's more story-driven, imagination, engaging and flirting and slow burn, all these things that actually capture our imagination all the time in, you know, Fifty Shades of Grey, Bridgerton, and, and other things in mainstream pop culture. So, um, yeah, just kind of bringing more, more creators into this space of erotic storytelling and scaling, hopefully rapidly, and yeah. <laughs> I mean, the reason I ask is because obviously you're in a very unusual category, and as we were talking at, at the beginning, still a lot of stigma and kind of cultural discomfort, and mm. so, you know, realistically, you know, we see a lot of large content companies sort of tread carefully around this type of content, mm -hmm. you know, advertisers get skirmish, and so yeah. I think it's super fascinating that you actually think that this could become a large company. Yeah, I mean, I see Quinn becoming a public company partly because of this, what you're talking about, that like, let's say like a Spotify or an Amazon or whatever, it's like this is maybe a category they'll be a little squeamish on. Although, like I said, you know, some of their top hits, their biggest performers are romance, AKA like erotica kind of style stories. And then I also think, um, like when I was starting Quinn, egg freezing and fertility startups were super taboo and no investors would touch it and it was just kind of this icky category. And now th there are a ton of unicorns, like Kind Body got a billion dollar valuation, all these startups are blowing up. And so I really do think the tides change, you know, and, and, and cultural, currents um, pull us in new directions, and I wouldn't be surprised if, there's, if this category becomes more and more mainstream. Are there companies out there that you kind of look to as like um, inspirations maybe in, as far as their business trajectory and what they've been able to accomplish? Uh, yeah, I mean, so many, <laughs> but I, lo I, mean, I love Bumble. I think Whitney is just incredible. I think that was a category that previously was super stigmatized in, in a lot of ways. Um, I, I mean, I could really, I, <laughs> okay, I love Patreon, I love OnlyFans, I love, uh, obviously Apple, <laughs> uh, there are a lot of amazing companies. I actually think Airbnb is an interesting one, I love Airbnb, and it's like a great example of a curated marketplace, which is something Quinn is kind of trying to create in its own way, so that's maybe a, a non, um, like, content one that I like a lot. <laughs> actually, let's do some audience. Participation. Oh. Has anyone used Quinn in the audience? Is anyone nice. bold enough to raise their oh. hand? Yay! <laughs> <laughs> I wish we could well. get you on stage to have like some user feedback. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> See, now you have a new, uh, a new person to interview backstage. <laughs> Yeah, use code slash. No, we should actually set that up. That would be great. <laughs> um, since we're coming up on, yeah. you know, towards the end of our conversation, I'd love to hear some of your uh, creator economy predictions for 2024, and then we'll talk about in 10 years. <laughs> okay. Um, I think in near term uh, predictions, just really a focus on, I mean, I know people say this all the time, but like, the focusing on a small group of diehard fans rather than sort of the Instagram model of like 100,000 kind of casual fans that don't really know you that well, right? I'm definitely seeing, especially with Quinn creators, just the rise of like a 50 person like diehard fan club basically um, for a creator and, and really monetizing those people who are willing to spend thousands of dollars on their favorite, it's, you know, patronage really of their favorite creators and favorite, um, internet personalities. And then longer term, I just think creators will own more and more of the stuff they're creating because truly they drive so much of the value that we like consume on the internet. And yeah, so I just think increased creator ownership. <laughs> well, how do you, what does that mean for your company, right? Because you're sort of in the middle enabling the content creators to create mm -hmm. and to connect with fans but then you're predicting that the creators will have more and more control. 
Well, yeah, I think that, like our value has always been that creators should have creative control, that they should be able to decide their boundaries with their audience, and really, we're just in support of that relationship. So we'll stay that way. <laughs> All right, I have to ask you before we wrap it up. Yeah. Who is your favorite Quinn creator? Oh, no. Um, it's a tie with all of them. I can't pick favorites. It's like favorite children. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, thank you so much for being here, thank Caroline. You so thank much. you guys so much. This is so fun. <laughs> Go Slush. I love it here. <laughs>